Oh God. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Just so I could choose my yeah, options. We, we wanted to give you all the flavor choices. What if I wanted a suicide? Oh, you could. Do you want a pint glass? <laughs> <laughs> that sounds awesome. Yeah, I mean, I don't give a fuck. Yeah, okay. Nope. I mean, we'll finish them all at some point anyways. Absolutely. Or I'll just have like four suicides. You can only do the one. The math works You can out. only do one suicide as far as I know. <laughs> That's not how I've been working it. Yeah, fuck it. I'll do it. Why That's not? a weird place to join the conversation. We'll do that and then we'll start talking about. It is painless. <laughs> okay. It brings on many changes. We're going to have a good F. If... Oh, shit. You're doing all four? That's a suicide, baby. I didn't Gotta realize... do all the flavors. I mean, I kind of want it on this. I don't want to go upstairs again. All right. That's <laughs> Sucker. You missed your chance. You didn't understand what a suicide was. Did you have a childhood? Oh, I thought we were just talking about killing ourselves for our, for our glorious God. Like a regular childhood. <laughs> did you guys, uh, did you notice that in Matchstick Men, it was the Oh God oh quote? God. Yeah. Oh no. God. That's Ooh. where that's from. Did you not know where that was from? <laughs> no. <laughs> I think, honestly, my favorite quotes from Nick Cage and Matchstick Men is just going to end up being him being like, uh, uh. You know what my favorite quote was? Welcome back to Cage Match of Roundabout Way of Meeting Nicolas Cage. Yeah, I'm just going to make it weirder from now on. Deal with it, Nick. Do it backwards next time. <laughs> nice. I'm your host, Sean, here with my co-host. I'm Nick. And our producer. Hello, I'm Peter. Which episode is this? This is episode 30. Oh. Yeah, this is episode... Yeah, we're, we're almost done with round one. 30 wow. of our bracket-style Nicolas Cage... Uh, where we're going to find out what the most cagiest Nick Cage film is, as decided by us, some idiots in a basement. I'm yep. not going to lie. If you put all four flavors in one cup, that's pretty good. You know what I'm most excited for for this conversation? Where that gets edited in. <laughs> I, I'm going to leave it right there. That seems perfect. And about what, what else gets uh, edited in around it? <laughs> well, you could talk about how sticky my end of the table is going to be I at mean, the end of the night. I mean, sticky at this point. I spilled lime sparkle buddy all over everything already. So Excellent. I'm glad yeah. I showered right before coming here. Yeah. There it is. Me too. Oh, it's everywhere. <laughs> yeah. It's hot out. We're in the basement. It's cooler here, but it's still not great. I don't know. This is actually pretty nice. This is very, very uh, acceptable. I mean, well, we're going to hot a... mouth this thing for a little bit, yeah. and then it'll be a different story. It's a good thing we all decided to take our pants off. Well, yeah, that is tradition. The real trick is never wear pants. I mean, this is how you know. This is how you have a comfortable conversation with a group of guys in a basement. This week, we are <laughs> in our comedy category discussing comedy in quotes, discussing Matchstick Men versus Guarding Tess. Anyway, yeah. so Guarding Tess. <laughs> Let me take that again. <laughs> Guarding Tess? Guarding Tess. Guarding Tess. Guarding Tess. Ooh, I like that. <laughs> I watched a lot of Telemundo as a kid. You, you can tell because of how Japanese that accent sounds. <laughs> I didn't watch TV. I don't know what people are. This is going to be one of those episodes, folks. Yeah, we're, we're nailing it so yeah. far. So Guarding Tess starring Nicholas Cage as Secret Service Agent Doug Chesnick and Shirley MacLaine as former First Lady Tess Carlisle. And yeah. huge pain in the ass. Absolutely. Former first lady, huge pain in the ass. Yeah. So the whole premise of this film is Nicolas Cage is Secret Service security for a former first lady. He's done his three year stint. He's going to go back to Washington. He wants to guard the president, but she wants him back. Not because she likes him or anything, just because she's kind of a bitch. But then maybe she likes him. But then <laughs> she doesn't. But then maybe she does. Well, Tess is a lot like an ogre. Which is to say she's like an onion. Which is to say she has layers. And those layers are revealed to us over the course of 90 minutes with no lead-ins. I feel about as strongly about this movie as I do kind of anything. It's just, I don't, I don't know. This movie, it's such a movie of 1994. Yeah. Like, uh, let's talk about that. It's like 1994. It's... Times are a little bit slower. Comedy movies, action movies, like they just have a different pace. It's like a Greek tragedy. It's just you watch it and you hate it, but you have to understand its historical relevance. 
Did you guys? God, that's look, actually a really good way of putting yeah, it. Did you guys look up this? <laughs> uh, fuck you. So I've been drinking. The director uh, and writer Hugh Wilson. Did you see what his one other big hit was? Blast from the past. Brendan Fraser. Oh, the, the Bubble Boy the one. Yeah. Yeah. I never watched that movie. I should watch it. Yeah. I'll give this guy 100% of my support. Guarding Tess and Blast from the Past. There you go. Full coverage. Yep. This movie's fine. Yeah, it, it was definitely the weirdest romantic comedy I've watched this week. <laughs> that You know what? The same can be said for both of these films. Yeah. That is true. Ooh, I don't like that. <laughs> well, we're going to get into that. Uh, yeah, so Nick Cage comes in. He is... As you said, the Secret Service agent covering Tess Carlisle. Her husband passed away, so it's just her. She's kind of become a recluse, and it's become the dead-end position for a lot of Secret Service agents. Like, nobody wants this job. She's super difficult. Everyone else seems to be fine with the job because it's easy. And Nick Cage's character, uh, Doug, he wants to be in the action. Well, yeah, I mean, like, he used to guard her husband yeah. the president and now he feels like he's just getting shelved and she doesn't ever really give him respect you know up until you know the beginning of this movie she's just difficult and yeah. it makes it hard for somebody who like really wants to you know make a career out of his life they kind of have some backs and forths. They argue. He quits a couple times. She manages to unquit him against his will numerous times. I can't quit you, bub. Yeah, through phone conversations with the president. And that's, yeah, uh, th yeah anytime, those are like some of the best comedy moments. That and I Fred, liked the president. Is it anytime Frederick? He like, or Frederick, the, uh, the nurse. Was he a dietician? Yeah, he's the nurse. He's the living oh, okay. nurse. Gotcha. So, the uh, hospice nurse or whatever. I so, liked him. Yeah, he was, he was good, good too. Also, he was a uh, Vernon from a uh, Harry Potter series, the, uh, oh, yes, the shitty was. uncle. Yeah. Uh, and the president was voiced by the director of this film. Hugh Wilson. Hugh Wilson. Which is not Rain Wilson. No. Or, or Luke Wilson. So I'm just going to... Or... <laughs> oh. Owen Wilson. There we go. We got all the Wilsons. Wow. Brian Wilson. So for this film, I'm just going to say up front, there's not really a way to discuss the plot of this film in any roundabout way where we're just not going to spoil it. This movie's n not got a lot going for it. It's a random series of events. They hate each other. They suddenly don't hate each other anymore. Because of whiskey. Because of whiskey. Yeah, they kind of rebuild their relationship. And she, you know, she actually starts to give a little. She compromises. She opens up and kind of lets him into her world. So the crux of their relationship, as it's kind of described in the film, is He's leaving. He did his three-year stint. She wants him to sign on for three more years. She has an operable brain cancer. Allegedly. Allegedly. It doesn't... It's not really a plot point is my kind of issue with it. I'm like, is this a film about an old lady who feels isolated and has a hard time making friends and wants to have this connection with someone she deeply cares for, which doesn't seem to be the case until it is. Like, there's no build to them, like, having camaraderie. He quits and then gets yelled at by the president to come back. She doesn't want him back, and then suddenly they're drinking buddies. Tess Carlyle, as the character, is somebody who definitely like holds a lot of things to themselves. You see her connection to Nick Cage only through old movie like film from like her president or her husband's days as president when he was guarding him. And really you see the connection at the footage from the funeral from the president where Nick Cage is visibly upset about the death of the president. And he died from a heart attack. It wasn't anything like yeah. Nick Cage's fault or anything. And she's keeping him around because emotionally he cared about the president as much as she did. So they have that common bond. See, this is why you keep me here for sensitive well, stuff. So, okay. Here's the thing. Cause I had another read on that because on when the they finally go the and finger have on their, something, when they finally go to have their drinks, their whiskey, she just straight up asks them, were you aware of my husband's infidelity? I'm like, oh, is she just mad at him? No. No, no I mean, I, I, I see your reading of it, and I, yeah. I agree with you, but like, I don't feel like their relationship necessarily builds. But no, I, I miss that, so thank you. It, I mean, I'm, I'm seeing more subtext. Like, this doesn't, it doesn't give you a lot to like grab onto for these relationships. Yeah. Even like the brain tumor thing, like that comes out in a moment where... Nick Cage is pressuring her about something 
she just comes out with like, I've got an in- inoperable brain tumor. And then she goes on to say two more things. And yeah. she says, one of these things is true. Yeah. Yeah, I Which bought, one is it? I bought and, all of your crew scud missiles and we're going to go to the opera. Yeah. And then they did go to the opera. But was two that, things were true. Was that just because that's what Nick Cage thought was the truth? Or well, was it because she's dying and she's actually trying to get out and enjoy a little bit of her life? Peter and I kind of discussed this. It's just like, that in and of itself is a really interesting movie. Person is dying and is trying to make a connection with the one constant person in their life. That's a cool movie. And the one person who they feel had a, like a good connection with their husband. That too. Which that, I, that I mean, deepens the connection. Yeah. The third act kidnapping twist <laughs> kind of comes out of nowhere and makes us a very different film all of a sudden. Yeah, I, they started to build it up earlier because Tess is so prone to like these acts of rebellion. Yeah. She do a runner. Yeah, she just like does things to spite her Secret Service because whether she wants them there or not, I don't know. Yeah, but I don't think there's anything that's like necessarily out of place in this movie or pushing into like unnecessary. I would challenge you to cut. 10 yeah I without think, like i could cutting cut, anything I can, I can actually give you that so. um i think the presidential visit that gets canceled is about 10 minutes of content and it doesn't really serve anything it shows like kind of how neglected she is like and why she has the attitude she does towards washington because she calls it a dying city she talks about how no good like is where careers go to die Look at her. She's been completely discarded. Her husband was the president of the yeah. U.S. And he's died. And now she's just like this puppet piece that they like to put out there. The president was going to come and be a part of this dedication of a library or a charitable wing or something. And it just falls through. And at the last minute, and who do they get? They get like a commerce chairman. Yeah, Secretary or of Transportation or yeah. whatever. It's like, bleh. I think ultimately I would have. Although if Pete Buttigieg showed up to my thing, I'd be pretty cool. Yeah, that would that. be cool. Yeah. I mean, ultimately for me, I just, I would have liked a little tighter focus narrative on their relationship because I think those are the main beats, but they don't really build to each other. The There's thread's also, pretty kind of thin. Yeah. And I mean, where I would cut is the visit from her son, which is about five minutes of good call. her son like just coming mm. to like get her to invest in his shitty property and a property deal. And she just says no. And then later during their conversation, she was like, I'm not close to my kids. I'm like her son showing up as a one-off scene. Didn't doesn't. Do I mean, it, it ties to Nick's point about like her loneliness and absolute, yeah. like I'm just good. desolate. Lifestyle, like the disenfranchisement but... of the elderly. Mm. But then they talk about it later. I mean, and, it, and then I, they pork. Yeah. <laughs> Again, we're going to talk about that matchstick man. Yeah. <laughs> what do you guys think of uh, Shirley MacLaine's performance in this? I think she was good. Oh, she was annoying as fuck, which I guess is good. <laughs> I mean, that's, I mean, that's what character. she was going for. She irritated me. <laughs> yeah. I mean, she's. I think she's supposed to. But as soon as like she warms up, she is quite likable. Yeah. She I mean, plays a salty old biddy pretty well, though. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't heard the term biddy in forever. <laughs> as soon as like, and as soon as they have their one on one, like, I mean, that's where the turn is, where she becomes really likable and kind of funny. Again, there's no build to it. She's just like, we, we're we drinking buddies now. The next day she comes out of her room and she's kind of like, oh, everyone, let's be friends. Yeah, her general demeanor towards the rest of the staff is strangely tied to how her relationship with Doug Chesnick goes. Yeah. But, and, and that's kind of weird. I can understand like her and Frederick getting, well, her and the house staff, it really is Doug Chesnick secret service detail of like seven people yeah. who you probably see two of at any given time the driver the who's part of the kidnappers yeah the driver the kid uh kitchen staff the cook the nurse and her well, secretary I, yeah. I don't think we ever see her interact with the kitchen staff she comes down in one scene i mean it's it's very very quick. no, no she yeah she down. just rolls through she rolls but through, like but like in terms of acting i don't see we we don't see her interact with anyone but the driver and her yelling at her nurse to like putt. But the rest of them are just. Oh, no, that was her secretary. her secretary. But you can assume that because of her relationship with her secretary, when the secretary comes up to Doug Chesnick later and she's like, hey, she gave me a job when nobody else yeah. would. It's like she is a big, big hearted lady. Yeah. Uh, you know, she's just tough to get close to. But she, 
And now she's just a little tougher because, like, her husband's gone. Yeah. No, I get it. I want nuance. Sure. I mean, this this movie does lack some of the finer touches. It could have been executed a little smoother. The relationships are kind of... Uh, I fill in a lot myself. Yeah. There's a line, I think, in the sand between how much, like, relationship talk you can have before a movie moves from being a romantic comedy to just, like... A drama. I think what I wanted is, Wait, is whoa, a little whoa. more. This is, wasn't a romantic comedy. I want, what? It, it they should have been. Totally boned down at the end. Did you not see the after credit scene? The wheelchair. Scene? The wheelchair after credit yeah. scene. Yeah. Ooh boy. They Nick Cage is in the wheelchair. <laughs> She's like, put those brakes on. <laughs> You're not going nowhere. I was. Boy. I was wondering where the jokes were. Okay, cool. We're back to our comedy <laughs> podcast. Speaking of his performance and geriatric sex. <laughs> yeah. What did you guys think of uh, him as Chesnick? It's fine. Yeah, it's fine. It's not a breakout role, obviously. It was 94, 10 years after like his start. Like Every um, performance in this film is very serviceable. If I'm thinking about it, it slots in really well with the, per- like, the roles he was getting at that time. Because we're pre-97, so he's not an action. He's not like a big A-list star yet. Hasn't we're, won his Oscar yet. We're just kind of like a few years past, like, Birdie... And some of his art. Peggy Sue. Yeah, his yeah. art stuff. Yeah, like with Peggy Sue and probably... Uh, it Could Happen to You. It Could Happen to You. He's like right in that kind of like romantic lead. Right, where there, he's like a little more restrained, but not totally. They still want some of his wild card. Wackiness. Yeah. But... Wacky. Yeah. He really doesn't have a big unhinged aspect on this one. No, mm. I mean... He he plays exasperated really well. Yeah, he's definitely like too old for this shit. But as far as like a Nicolas Cage performance, I don't think we have anything that like really screams like wild. No, he, like I don't think it's a personal role for him. No, no, I agree with that, and I think what's telling is that not a lot stood out in terms of quotable content. Right? No, this like his portion of the script does not hold a whole lot. I struggled to find anything. I did find one just to have something ready. And it's when Tess is now suddenly happy and a pleasant person to be around. And they go grocery shopping because she's going to like have a dinner Mm. uh, before the president cancels. And Doug is there with the store manager and he's communicating back and forth with another Secret Service agent who's with Tess. And Tess wants to know how much the price of peas are. So they have a back and forth and it's what, like 59 cents for like uh, two for one. And she's like, what if I want, want one? And he just responds back with uh, Bobby. It's two for, it's a two for one thing. So I suggest you just go ahead and get both. Yeah. Like that's his one comedy line in this movie. Yeah. There <laughs> really isn't a lot. Well, like in the end, like he kind of gets, with the doctor oh, yeah. when she's leaving the hospital and the doctor's like, you have to leave. Like it's he hospital t- protocol. You have to leave in a wheelchair. And Nick Cage is just like, is showing his personal growth being like, are the rules that sacred? And then he turns to Tess and he's just like, get in the goddamn wheelchair. Yeah. Uh, and that's growth on both sides. Yeah. Like he's allowing to, listen. yeah, he's compromising on the rules. But he's also like making this relationship where they can be this kind of candid yeah. together, which is kind of like the, you know, the the apex of their story. Yeah. Well, I mean, maybe him saving her from being buried alive is nah. the apex of their story. Not but that important. Yeah. He's like, she would have been all right. Give her the cancer story or give her the kidnapping story. It didn't need both. Yeah, that's true. I mean, you needed some kind of inciting incident to make her want to change. And the cancer or well tumor yeah. uh, is kind of like what makes her want to. It's what changes her day to day life. Yeah. If this movie was only about the kidnapping, you could jump 60 minutes into the movie and just watch an episode. Well, then just have their relationship after the kidnapping, have the kidnapping be the second bit, have their relationship grow after that. I'm just saying there's a way to clean this up where it's more focused on their relationship, which is ultimately what I think this movie's supposed to be about. You write me a 90-page screenplay 
that I <laughs> fixes will. this. It'll be for the patrons. Yeah, I and will. We'll do a we'll do a table read. Ah, oh, oh my god! It'll be you, me, Peter, and uh, well, we got to get Marissa. Oh yeah, and she could. Oh, she could be Tess. <laughs> I was going to say, I she, could be, had she could be Frederick. Pegged for Frederick, yeah. yeah. This sounds like a fun experiment. There's a um, a podcast I like to listen to every once in a while with this guy, Kyle Ayers. Yeah, let's plug other podcasts on our podcast. There's nothing wrong with that. It's cross-podcasting. And uh, it's called Never Seen It. And they, they better um, thank us for those seven extra views. They're oh, they're going to love this uptick. <laughs> um, but then they're going to realize they are li- Rico's listening to them and they're not going to like it. So they take um, love you, Rico. random comedians and people come on. And Don't touch They me. will have not seen a movie and then will have written a spec script based on what they think the movie's about. And then they perform it live on mic. And it's usually pretty fucking funny oh that's good and this is it's more, a good concept this is similar not dissimilar to my idea of a uh, cold open true guardian tests uh on the uh good cage bad cage good movie bad movie good bad bad good bad bad good good bad good uh where do we put this one i think this is just a flat line medium performance no standout i don't know that he was given an inch on this one the movie's fine I mean, it's good enough. I'm glad I watched it. Yeah. Cinematically, I'm glad I saw it. It's very 1994, as you pointed out. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Didn't really think about it in that respect. And when you said, like, this is just what comedies were like at the time, I'm like, you know what? You're right. They were simpler times. <laughs> yeah. It was the pre raunchy comedy. It is weird, though. You think about the pacing difference between a movie from the, like, mid-90s versus what we get now. Like, ours are so frenetic. Fast pace. Two hours. <laughs> I'm struggling to Someone think about what the that last lady. <laughs> comedy I went to was. Like, completely excluding all comic book movies. I mean, for me, it would be Barbie. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't been out in a couple of weeks. So how about we talk about Matchstick Men? Sure. So, 2000... That's right, I can segue, motherfucker. Four? 2003? Three. Okay, so the year I graduated high school. Same! Yeah. Peter, um, when did you graduate high school? 2002. Yeah. Ooh, look at Mr. Smarty Pants here. Slightly old. Look at Mr. (laughs) Look at Mr. Didn't fail the first grade over here. Oh, loser! Yeah, I failed failed communion. (laughs) Communion. Wow. As a Catholic, (laughs) did you just not get the wafer? Like, did it not go in the mouth? No, the nuns were so. Did you have to? Were you raised Catholic? Oh yeah. Okay, you went to like the the class that preceded. Absolutely. So. The nuns were concerned by my behavior because (laughs) when they asked us to draw pictures and stuff, this is straight from my mother. I was drawing pictures of children doing bad things, like a picture of a kid breaking dishes. And then I would draw a picture of a kid like pushing somebody over. (laughs) It's like I only like would draw like pictures of disobedience. So I was not allowed to pass communion at originally. I get that that would be a red flag. It seems like a bad reason to not let you get communion. Oh, this it's is, a, they give that to bad people. It's yeah. a continuing like pattern the, with me. Like whole, I failed Hunter's safety. The whole reason you get communion is so you can have those thoughts and it's okay. <laughs> I wasn't uh, even allowed to get to the point where I could was up for communion. Sean's I, not allowed in church. <sighs> You're not wrong. So um, <laughs> my Sunday... Uh, I went it's to, a boner thing, isn't it? It 100% is. <laughs> I went to Sunday school all of three times. And the third time... After the third uh, after the third mass, after Sunday school, my Sunday school teacher asked my parents that I not return. Because at the ripe age of six, I had questions about the feasibility of like the garden of eden how many people came out of it um the art transubstantiation transubstantiation also i was really into animals at the time so i knew like what continents animals lived on and for them like to all for them to be two by two on one arc didn't make sense to me and it wasn't so much that i had questions it's that i had follow-up questions Mm. yeah those are the ones that they usually don't plan for other kids started asking questions because of my questions and rather than you know trying to indoctrinate me they were just like get him the fuck out of here so you and i have two entirely different methods of inciting rebellion you're going to try to like 
inspire the people and i'm just going to start a fire i mean i'm mostly trying to both are effective subtleties on both ends yeah Yeah. this is why we're friends yeah do you smell smoke (laughs) i am really good at burning things we both just want to burn it all down you're you're trying to burn it all down i'm trying to get other people to burn it down for me yeah (laughs) so were you not a pangea guy (laughs) yeah one continent bra yeah Yeah. man one love (laughs) Not not when the Bible happened. <laughs> yeah, why not? Because <laughs> humans aren't that old. Listen, dude, you can have continents shift real quick. <laughs> I'm, it's you know like what? surfing. I'm from San Francisco. <laughs> I know this surfing shit moves. USA. You just take that tectonic plate yeah, just all, all the, the way, way up. over, baby. Ride that wave. <laughs> That's what the Beach Boys were really singing about: the breakup of the Pangaea continent. <laughs> it happened in 1915. <laughs> <laughs> Which is why we were able to have a world war shortly after. Right. Yeah. New this, world. This makes sense. Otherwise, it would have just been a Pangea war. <laughs> Fuck it. If it's Pangea, it's technically a civil war. It's all one. It's yeah. all one land mass. That's right. New world. Just like tomatoes. <laughs> what? They're a new world like crop. Um, yeah. Go back to our episode with, with uh, Daryl. Daryl, where I point that out. You were talking about watermelons. Though. It was watermelons. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, there, that is too. Way to way to call back your own joke. Yeah. It's a good one. You can self-reference. Nobody else is going to reference my jokes. <laughs> <laughs> I have to be the one to point out how clever they are. I mean, some people still listen to us. Hi, Lance. Yeah, we have a new patron, <laughs> a new cage dancer. Thank you, Lance. Ah, uh, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> he doesn't get his moment till can, the end. He can get a double dip. I had a very like heart to heart well not heart to heart but like face to face conversation with him and dick we talked about like the show and did you dock yeah 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 of course he and i talked about uh the that's band part Sparks. of the cage dancer tier oh absolutely. it's like you get to dock with me wait do you have a foreskin i 3d printed one <laughs> smart that's yeah good you just slide it on the tip yeah because i i mean honestly i think that's kind of my whole like shtick in uh our friend group your foreskin your shtick oh. is your foreskin <laughs> dick is uh i still have my turtleneck that's true <laughs> i so rarely make <laughs> nick like turn from the microphone to like snicker 80 percent of that was me burping because <laughs> i don't do that on mic why? i'll fart on mic but i will not burp on why mic. can't you let me have this nick <laughs> yeah why is one gas better than the other uh ass gas rhymes all right. I Everybody can't. knows rhymes. Listen, r- man, rule. I can't argue with this. Yeah. Rhymes rule. Ass, gas. Ass, gas. Ass and gas do rhyme. I can confirm. <laughs> All right. <laughs> as two uh, native uh, English speakers. <laughs> Matchstick men, Nick Cage as Roy. I couldn't tell. Waller. Just, because the pizza out. guy says Walker. Yeah, he fucks and it up. And he corrects him and says Waller. I was just looking at what I wrote down. I'm like, that doesn't look like a name. And Nick Cage <laughs> is, an, uh, is a con man with extreme OCD who reconnects with his long lost daughter, uh, Angela, played by Allison Lohman. And Sam Rockwell is Nick Cage's protege. Protege. That's the word I was thinking of. Frank Mercer. So two con men conning about trying to get that one last big score that is all mixed up when Nick Cage finds his long lost daughter. Directly by Ridley Scott, and this is not Ridley Scott's best movie. Uh, definitely not monetarily. But before we talk about like the rest of that, how about that editing? Like all those fades, the wipes, and the weird. The intro credits. Oh, this well, is no like in the movie. No, there's like know. weird wipes the that go on, like transitioning is... from scenes. There's weird slow motion things that happen. It's oh, like. No. Did Zack Snyder it's, recut this? It's crazy, it's like, man. The and like the Hans is... Zimmer score paired along with that. That do 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 oh. do 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 all the names are just bouncing off the side of the screen like a fucking 90s Windows screensaver. Like a DVD player yeah. logo bad. bouncing around. I, I could not figure out why that was what they went with for that. Like, it doesn't make any sense other than the fact that it's, like, overlaid on his pool. Is that it? No. But, like, uh, I don't know. It blows. <clears throat> on mic, really? Rude. Nick, rude. rude. <laughs> why would you do that? 
face gas on mic? <laughs> Shameful. That doesn't even rhyme. No, no, more, put... no more suicides for you, Nick. Uh, pardon me, my mouth has been on all of these. <laughs> That's not true. It's not, but it will be if you try to take them away from me. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you dare touch this alcohol, sir. <laughs> So, what you, okay, what Nick do you Cage think of this Sam movie? Nick Cage and Sam Rockwell are common. Uh, I enjoy Nick Cage. I enjoy Sam Rockwell. What I did not enjoy is the severe... And this might be existing as a millennial in the year of our Lord 2023, <laughs> that I've watched a lot of adult documentaries about exactly this premise. Whoa! <laughs> no... Nicholas Cage. That's not a stepdaughter, bro. <laughs> that's like yeah, that's she's a, not that's his a daughter. 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 She's well, not his daughter. But he thinks she is for the lion's share. Of yeah, those. but I know she's not because not during the porking parts. <laughs> he's definitely being caught. I don't like their chemistry in this movie at all. Uh, yeah, the fact that you could call it chemistry is probably the biggest issue, right? Yeah. I'm not here to yuck anyone's yum. I know. Uh, I, I you you can be here to yuck that yum. That's that's okay. You know, <laughs> you know there there are consenting adults who like the like the little scene. Yeah, but not with their own kid. And I mean, I don't think that's what they were going for, but that's definitely the feeling. That I is got. the vibe that comes across. Yeah, I was uncomfortable. Oh for man, all of it. As somebody who doesn't like kids, uh, for the most part. I, uh, especially when they get to this age. Like, she's playing 14 years old. Oh, man. If some 14-year-old started, like, coming around my place and being like, you're my dad, I'd be like, we are going to get DNA tests for sure. Like, immediately. Especially if I'm a con man by trade. Like, anybody comes up and says, like, oh, this, that, or nothing. I wouldn't trust anybody. I'm already very untrusting. Yeah. And... If you added in financial gain for not trusting people, like I would never trust anybody. No, it's it's so. I'd wear a condom to record podcasts. I wouldn't trust you guys that much. <laughs> got a got a podcast safe. I wouldn't trust myself either. <sighs> I don't know. Okay, so I don't know why this cut, made me. Peter, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna not, cut that part. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. I don't know why this made me Peter, think of though, that, but you need to cut that part, but not cut this part. <laughs> right. <laughs> So when I was in, in Connecticut, I was with my, my brother and we were talking about the song Riding Dirty. Oh, and fuck yeah. What did Riding Dirty even mean? Because I'm, now I I'm mean, thinking about you coming in here. Go back to my previous to... statement. <laughs> no, to... fuck you. <laughs> that statement that has been edited out of this podcast, but this part has not been edited out of the but podcast. But what the fuck is Riding Dirty? Butt stuff. They see me rolling, the hate in, yeah. patrolling, trying to catch me riding dirty. Yeah. What the fuck is that? That's not butt stuff. Gay butt stuff. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, now yeah. we're talking. Which is what rappers are always like bragging about. Yeah, they gay love butt stuff. talking about gay butt stuff. But they're worried about being seen about it because there's a weird like. Only by haters. That's true. They patrolling. Yeah. <laughs> so in match six. None, none of this is usable. None of this is usable. Keep it all. Start fresh. No, we're, we're <laughs> guarding test. Scrap the whole fucking episode. I'm Welcome going back home. to Cage Match Colon or Roundabout Way Meeting Nicholas Cage. I'm going to run back to the lion. Slam yeah. a beer. Slam a beer. Come back. Yeah. <laughs> we'll do another suicide. Yeah. <laughs> That's four suicides. The maximum number of suicides. <laughs> There's only three of us. I checked <laughs> mathematically. Okay. So, Allison Lohman. The, the like dad daughter stuff is a little creepy, so undeniably. But it's like, weird because we talk, we joke a lot about how like a forty year old will play a teenager, and that's weird. But somehow like she's twenty three, twenty three in this role, 14. playing fourteen. But it's like no, you're an actress playing younger, but you actually look like a teenager. And there's a lot of like Danny talk, and it's just I don't like any of it. Uh, yeah, it it's weird how. She looked young. Mm-hmm. I don't know what she looks like now. Probably less young. Well, her career is really weird. So she did this movie. She was in Flicka, and then she did Drag Me to Hell. And then beyond that, she's done like little bit parts. I did and, like Drag Me to Hell. Oh, I did too. God, I haven't seen that since about 2000. Whenever it came out. Ish, yeah. Like whenever it came out. Yeah. Kind oh. of a good movie though. Yeah. So <laughs> here's my Drag Me to Hell story because I have one. Uh, my buddies all went to go see 
drag me to hell. I wasn't there. Uh, so this is actually a, a third party story. But they all go, oh, it must have been like 2003 because uh, you had to be 18 because it was rated R. And they all show up at this movie. My buddy Steve is only 17. Like he hasn't turned 18 yet. 2009. He's going to. 2009. Drag me to hell. Jason Long. Oh no! What's the Justin Jack the Ripper movie? Justin Long. Oh, uh, From Hell. Oh, okay. Oh, Never yeah. mind. Different movie. Here's my From Hell story. <laughs> so my buddies all go. <laughs> Keep all of that, Peter. <laughs> the From Hell story for Allison Lohman. Yeah. That you're talking about. Who's not, who's not in, in that? From hell. Yeah, fuck her. We're not talking about her anymore. No, uh, that is my issue with Matchstick Men. <laughs> yeah. So uh, they all go to see this movie, and Steve's not old enough. <laughs> So everybody else still decides to go see From Hell. <laughs> and Steve's only choice. <laughs> he watches Corky Romano. <laughs> oh, that poor fuck. <laughs> but his movie's like an hour shorter, so he gets done with it. And then he just has to sit outside the theater for an hour. Why didn't he just buy a ticket to Cor- Corky Romano and go into your theater? <laughs> that would be untruthful, Sean. <laughs> That's a con. This is That's a flim flam. This is why you're a fucking Leonardo, dude. <laughs> hey, man, I'm just talking about Steve. He watched Corgi Rock. He's the only person I've ever met who's seen that movie, too, and he saw it in theaters. Dude, I saw that movie with, like, the worst case of the flu or pneumonia, oh just, like, on syndication on Comedy Central. <laughs> and, like, I... Wait, which one was Corgi Romano? So it's 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 like another pet detective movie. Catan, what, yeah, it was Chris well, it, Chris Catan. Is it? Yeah, and he plays like a dude who's related to the mob, but is like a total fucking moron. And I don't know, crimes happen around him, and he manages to be a hero accidentally because he's fucking stupid. I forgot this movie existed. Should Sorry, we just watch said, the movie and do an you episode? You said you watched Corky Romano. <laughs> yeah, no, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Sam Rockwell, what do you guys think? He is very much Sam Rockwell in this film. He yes. very much is. He has one perform. He has two performances. It's this character, or it's his character from the original Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles film, where he plays a teen who talks to a mutant rat. Third role, Moon. That movie fucking rules. Moon was a really Moon good movie. Moon was really good. I've got no beef with Sam Rockwell as an either. actor. Like to be completely across the board, I forget about him, but. When I see him, I'm like, oh, it's Sam Rockwell. Okay, I think that's a good distinction. Is I have no problem with Sam Rockwell's acting, but I do forget about him. And Sam Rockwell is in a weird, almost Nick Cagey place where you're either going to see him in a movie where you're like, wow, that was really good, or they just wanted Sam Rockwell. Yeah. The Hitchhiker's Guide movie, he's awful in, and he's full Sam Rockwell in that. Everyone's Wait. awful in that movie, though. Who was yeah, he Choke in... was kind of the same thing. Uh, he was uh, Zaphod Beeblebrox. Oh, yeah. Okay. But. Now that I think about it, I think the Hitchhiker's Guide movie, I don't think any of them were in the same space at the same time while acting, because no one has chemistry in that movie. Deschanel, Most Def. I mean, these people, I these mean, are all like dynamic actors. Yeah, and, and they do not act well together. Alan uh, Rickman. Uh, yeah, are you trying I mean, to tell robot, me that but... Alan Rickman wasn't on set with everybody <laughs> He was every in the day? suit. <laughs> what, what about the voice of the doors? Ah... <sighs> <sighs> They were there. Yeah, every time. It was you. It, yeah, it was. You caught me. I'm self-promoting. <laughs> okay, we have to talk about this movie. We can't have another episode where we don't talk about the movie. Well, we're, we're like three for three at this point. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we can have another episode where we don't talk about the movie. So long as we talk about one movie, we're pretty good, right? Yeah. No, we I mean, make okay. an arbitrary decision and nobody so, cares. It's a mild heist film. Uh, they are career con men. Nicolas Cage doesn't go for long cons. Sam Rockwell has one set up. Nicholas Cage, hyper OCD, drops his medicine down the garbage disposal, and his his shady anxiety drug dealer has skipped town. So Sam Rockwell sets him up with a therapist. He starts going to therapy, remembers he has it, like thinks about the kid he never uh, raised. Therapist finds the kid, meets the kid, he gets conned. I mean, the bigger question then is, did you guys pick up on the con? Yes. 100%. As soon as the daughter showed up, I'm like, oh, yeah. she's playing him. Yeah. I and uh, the Mark, I was just like, all right, he's in on it. And the therapist was in on it. Sam Rockwell caught me off guard. Ultimately, it made the most sense that he'd be the mastermind. But they kind of play him so safe throughout that, again, forgetting about Sam Rockwell, 
I kind of forgot he was a player in this film until he was ultimately the villain. I think the scene where they show up at Nick Cage's place and they do like the final bit of the con uh, where they get him was the best, most well orchestrated part of the movie. Everything that happened with uh, Nick Cage and the daughter leading up to that felt pretty clumsy and honestly fucking uncomfortably cringy. Yeah. Like, Agreed. I, well, as also somebody who doesn't have children and intends to have no children, I, th- I thought the scene at his place was really the best. Yeah. Uh, I thought that's where everybody sold their elements of the con the best. Like, yeah. You come in the the mark. They've been sticking this guy for like a money laundering scheme, and they did a a briefcase trade. He figured it out, didn't run off. Ended up back at Nick Cage's place with Sam Rockwell, who's who he's abducted. And so you, Nick comes into this place with uh, his daughter after a a very rough con, and Sam Rockwell is like beat up he's bloodied gets an ashtray thrown at his head yeah uh the who played the mark oh uh for Shet? bruce mcgill okay so bruce mcgill uh's character he has a gun he's got everybody contained and uh you just see the the everybody's got like a a reason to be anxious in yeah. this like in most of this movie there's very low emotional stakes for a movie about like conning people. It seems very lighthearted up until this scene where it's obviously gone wrong. And I don't, everybody plays it so well because Nick Cage is the only one who's not a part of it at this point. And Sam Rockwell had orchestrated this whole thing. They have an imaginary Mark who we know is in on it because of how he references things with like tracking down the daughter. Well, it was never actually his daughter, yeah. so they couldn't have tracked her down that way through the mom and everything to find Nick Cage's connection. It's just, I don't know, it, it was the tightest part of the script. And it's probably what they based the entire movie off of. Absolutely. Making this spin. So there right is there. one thing pre- the final con is clearly Sam Rockwell was planning this for a long, his character's planning it for longer. Cause in the opening scenes where Nick Cage, like takes his daily pill, goes through his like uno dos tray, like, uh, his, On to toi. yeah, re, uh, or his, whatever it is. his repetitions. It was Italian. He takes, and then yeah. he does it in Japanese as well, but he like, he takes a, he always takes a pill in the morning. Um, when you finally see the pills, when they're dropping down the sink, they look like Benadryl. They are Benadryl. Yeah. <laughs> So it seems like Sam Rockwell has been setting him up for even longer with another doctor that got him those pills. Right. It it leads into that like stress anxiety mode of yeah. needing yeah. to get this new doctor figured out because the other doctor was also under the table. Well, yeah, yeah he and, establishes that like he was getting his prescription illegally previously. And this new doctor is like, I'm not going to give you pills until you tell me like why you need them, which is drilling Nicolas Cage for information about former relationships and finds out that he had a child he never raised yeah it's a lot of leaps of faith in terms of a con but um as a con man you think you'd ask a question or two but But if you look at it it from the the film of like a like through the lens of like a heist film it's on point it's a decent they give you all the information leading up to it and then you have to connect the dots at the very end the biggest dick move though is there's the confrontation at the house a shot is fired. Uh, his daughter shoots the the mark. The, the mark who was holding them hostage, and then Nick Cage sends Sam Rockwell off with the daughter. Be like, take her home, get the fuck out of the country. Comes back inside. Guy's not there anymore. Nick Cage gets cold clocked, and then cold clocked, cold cocked. I no. always thought it was clock. What is it? No, it's cocked. cold cocked. Cold cocked. That's weirder coldest clock (laughs) is it weirder than like somebody like bashing you with a frozen alarm clock i kind of love that like a like an am fm radio alarm clock from a seven i always thought of like you you got clocked yeah oh you get oh yeah getting clocked does kind of make sense for just getting cocked (laughs) oh josie's called us out on giving up the 
ghost goat <laughs> yeah it, the real term is giving up the goat but you and i have said giving up the ghost so oh, on Mike i didn't make before. fun of you for that no Fuck. josie I've, has i failed <laughs> i've gotten so sorry much, josie <laughs> i've gotten so much shit for uh a lion's share versus lion's share because i always heard it as line as in a assembly line where you're doing the entire work of a line of people as opposed to lion's share, which makes no sense to me because lions, male lions, do the least amount of work. They fight hyenas, but they don't hunt or feed the pack. So what's your problem with that? <laughs> as a male lion myself. <laughs> yeah. Big pride right here. Hardcore <laughs> alpha in the hose. <laughs> Match dick man. <laughs> it's a good episode. I'm proud of this episode. Yeah. Sure, at it's least, at least some of us are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I think that definitely that, I mean, everything about that is the best scene. Yeah, it's is the, the con itself. The construction of the scene is the tightest. The script is the tightest. Him teaching his daughter how to con is a pretty fun scene. Yeah. The lotto thing. But then they give it up. They give up the ghost at that moment. Um, I'm sorry, but I think... Rude. Ghost. <laughs> of the ghost. By... I believe you mean giving up the goatsy. Yeah. <laughs> oh, giving up the goatsy. <laughs> uh, when Nick... <laughs> Don't shake your head. You nod in approval, sir. That's early internet. That is... That's the earliest internet. <laughs> <laughs> that bathtub girl oh yeah I tub plot, girl man. I am, tub girl and uh I lemon, plot, party. lemon party yeah baby i imply that nicholas cage and his daughter fuck in this film and giving up the goatsy is the one that makes you <laughs> not be pleased with me yep <laughs> all right line in the sand <laughs> the best parts of the movie are that it's the last 30 minutes of it yeah uh even like exiting that and going into his interviews with the police and everything like that great also part of the con yeah and well executed yeah yep when he like when he leaves the hospital room so he wakes up after being cold cocked that's how we got on this what's gonna be great is that i'm gonna take out the original part where we talk about cold clocking and it's just gonna sound like you were really weird saying (laughs) cold cocked putting the emphasis on the wrong <laughs> syllable cocked. anyway he got cocked <laughs> he got cocked so but he wakes up and it and was cold he wakes up in a hospital bed and the cops are there mcgill's dead and they're like you can go away for a long time you know, quote unquote dead calls his therapist all this stuff and then he like wakes up in the middle of the night and he's like hey turn on the ac and he like gets out of bed to go find the cops where he i bet he's been handcuffed to this whole time and as soon as he got up i'm like ah, there there there's the twist yeah and obviously like that's for us that's for like us. he would have been so out of it he probably wouldn't have put it together yeah because yeah. he was very groggy and kind of like fucked up yeah. in the previous interrogation scene so he gets up without any handcuffs and like goes and ends up just on the roof of a building. And it's like, yeah, there's a, there's your clothes with a little note set on top. He has a safety deposit box where he keeps all of his cash. We see how the con goes through and it's a, it's a good heist. We're overdubbed with Sam Rockwell's like, I got you letter. You know, I hope you appreciate the gift where he just leaves him like, hundred bucks yeah two three hundred bucks no it's it's a stack so it's probably like 50 it was in a thick stack so maybe twenty thousand dollars like enough to not like die twenty thousand dollars a thousand bucks max. twenty thousand dollars in hundred dollar bills a thousand bucks is is only like that thick it was pretty thick it was not that thick. it was not that thick. it It was was thin enough that it rested against the side and then like delicately it definitely was more than 10 bills though i bet he got 300 bucks that would have been three bills yeah it's more than three bills we're going we're gonna to do this still frame one yes. by one. Either way, it doesn't I matter. own the Blu-ray, so I'm going to blow this def. up. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to show you every... Not, not the fucking point. He's broke. <laughs> also, <laughs> as as an adult living in this year, $20,000 wouldn't get me that far. But in... Night, uh, oh, you had to talk about inflation. Josh, yeah. calculate this for us. Yeah. Go. Get our inflation calculator but, going. Um, that's what our so how Patreons do actually do are. work. They're just <laughs> you pay to do work. Yeah, you come on this show. Um, so what's more upsetting to me out of that heist is so he goes straight. He goes to work for the carp a carpet store where he runs into Angela, where she like her boyfriend is coming to like they just moved in together. 
he wants to buy carpet for the new apartment and they run into each other and they have an awkward you fleecing this guy and she's like no that was my like my only heist was you and he's like well you were good and it ends with uh so are you mad at me Bye, Dad. Bye, Dad. And I fucking hate their canvas. I, but I love the carpet he sold them. Oh, it's leopard, leopard print. print carpet yes. for their yeah. apartment, their single bedroom like, I'm glad studio apartment. He wrecked their asses. Yeah, yeah that's it. that was his revenge. <laughs> also, who swaps out like um, a rental? Yeah. Mm mm. Mm-mm-mm. I'm going to do as much damage to my place as I possibly can because I found where my landlord stores the spare carpet and I'm going to just patch in all the things I Perfect. fuck up. So the, the only thing that I have of note for the end of this movie is that the boyfriend is Francis Kranz or something like that. I can't remember his exact name. And in the first movie, Guarding Tess, it's Harry Lennox? Henry Lennox. Harry? Harry? Henry? Her- Doing what? Hank? One of the bodyguards. Yeah, one of the bodyguards in Guarding the Tess. The black character. Yeah, he's super skinny because he was young then. But he and um, Francis are in Dollhouse. Um, I don't know if you ever watched that oh, one. Oh, yeah, I love Dollhouse. It was good. It had one season. Yeah. And That's, it was kind of fun. It, like, like it was it pretty fun. Maybe it had two. No, it had one watchable season. One watchable <laughs> season is correct. Uh, quotes. Uh, so Nick Cage shows up at this pharmacy and he's been out of his meds that the faux doctor has been giving him. So and the guy who he yells at, said, I want to say his line was like, Hey dude, you ever heard of a line? <laughs> yeah. So he's cutting in line and he's just being like very awful. And he just turns to this guy. He's like, Hey, have you ever been dragged in the sidewalk and beaten until you pissed blood? <laughs> it's just good. And he does apologize like two seconds yeah. later. He's like, sorry, I yelled sorry, at you. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> like, sorry, I said pissed blood. <laughs> so my first quote for this film is, so Nick Cage, part of his OCD is he doesn't swear. He only actually swears one time in this movie and then like immediately regrets it. It's true. He says pygmies. So yeah, that's that was my first, uh, oh, sorry, that was my first quote. It. My longer quote, which let me see if I can do this one in one go, is the first time he visits his faux therapist, and his therapist is like trying to like get him to like open up. He's like, "Look, Doc, I spent last Tuesday watching fibers on my carpet, and the whole time I was watching my carpet, I was worrying that I might vomit. And the whole time I was thinking, I'm a grown man, I should know what's going on in my head. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized I should just blow my brains out and end it all. But then I thought, when well, if I thought more about blowing my brains out, I start worrying about." what that was going to do to my goddamn carpet, okay? So, that was a good day, Doc. And, and, I just want you to give me some pills and let me get on with my life. That's a good one, too. Good, bad, bad, good, bad, 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 good, good, bad, bad. Uh, good, good, bad, bad. I felt like this existed about on the same level, like, energy-wise. He played the script... And I think that was his involvement in this one. I didn't get anything like effort wise out of it from him. I don't know. I, I kind of disagree in, in terms of like some of the the Tourette's work that he was doing with the ticks. I mm. think he did a good job. I think that was a good performance. I think that he wasn't insensitive, which is really easy to do with Tourette's. That's true. Um, yeah. he They didn't play it insensitively or like they played it pretty clean and honest and that, that's hard to come across naturally i would say i think he was given more to do in this film than guarding tess i don't necessarily think that he gave more personally of the performance between the two i think he was fine he was entertaining again this might just be the world we live in in terms of the internet and pornography um i do not like A pornography <laughs> Panography? Panography. I don't... Calligraphy? I, yes, I don't... Th- this is what gets me going. Panography. Look at that fucking pen mm. stroke. <laughs> I don't I don't like his performance with... Alison Lohman. With Alison Lohman in this film. It's, it's just... <sighs> it's so uncomfortable. It is very uncomfortable. Like, obviously, he's a character who, like, wants so bad to, like, retake this moment in his past because he had this terrible... Like, this relationship that he fucked up and he acknowledges... And at the crux of that, there was the question of a child 
and he could like retake that that portion of his life he could like make amends for the shitty person he was if he i don't know was a good dad now so he like puts all of his effort into that and that blinds him to being scammed even though like obviously there's the checkoff line of make sure you're not getting conned by the person you're conning first lesson that he gives her as she cons him yeah i never liked the whole daddy daughter interaction yeah i mean none of it played genuine to me no as someone who is neither a dad or a daughter but as someone uh, who exists on the internet today yeah, and sees all sorts of dad daughter interactions. Yeah. All right, I think we're good on this. Um, <laughs> we watched our, we had watched adult documentaries. Yeah, I know you are documentarians. Uh, <laughs> I watched one today for posterity. Good. Uh, what movie moves forward? For me, in terms of both these films, I think they're both flawed. I think one's a better film, but I think one makes me less uncomfortable. Here's my opinion. I thought that. I thought Magic Men was going to like go down. I thought it was like a hard no after my first watch. It holds up well enough after a second watch. Like I thought the conceit was going to like make it unwatchable, but I was still able to sit through it. It kind of made it more fun to watch for watch for those. those yeah, things. I mean they give it up so early that you kind of see it all as it progresses anyways, but it doesn't it doesn't hurt to rewatch. And it's still kind of clever enough to keep you going. I think the performances are better. But my problem with it is it's just so sloppily executed. The movie itself is just kind of ham-fisted. And while Guarding Tess, like, isn't as interesting to me, start to finish, it feels like a tighter movie all the way across the board. I I just feel better about the movie as a whole and Nicholas's performance in the movie. Yeah, we we're, we're dancing around it. Uh Nick, what do you what would you like to go forward? I think it's still guarding Tess for me. Uh, for same for me. So, so guarding Tess. Guarding yeah. Tess. Congratulations, Tess. This week in Cage. Uh we're getting closer to Long Legs. That's coming up soon retirement plan at some point um but also a a24 release is coming up dream scenario where there's like a town of people that are all having dreams about nicholas cage's bald ass head oh that's right yeah and he looks so good absolutely as like lumpy grandpa or lumpy uncle he's really hitting like a new pocket lumple yeah lumple Lumple cage lumple cage beautiful Thank you all for listening. Uh, Please rate, review, subscribe. Um, If you are interested in helping us out on Patreon, we are at Cage Match. Uh, Special thanks to our Sparkle Buddies, Josh, Sean, Josie, Rico, Matt, and Adam. And to our Cage Dancers, Ira, John, and Freeman. And newest Cage Dancer, Lance. Here's a golf clap for Lance. Yay! And here's something that suspiciously sounds like a golf clap, but isn't. (laughs) you guys are disgusting (laughs) uh so coming up next episode we've got a uh special guest josh and we're finally doing finally doing the bad lieutenant colon port of call hyphen new orleans against eight millimeter which is not a sequel stop thinking it's a sequel it has nothing to do with any other bad lieutenant movies (laughs) It is its own thing. They live in their own universes, people. There can be more than one bad lieutenant. (laughs) Yeah. So many lieutenants in the world. Most of them bad. It's a cop thing. Bye. 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 Listen, this is bros broing around. We all went to college. Winnie the Pooh and Donald Duckin. Yeah. Yeah. Whichever shirted, non-pantsed animal you like to associate with. I feel like that was a lot of Hanna Barbera stuff, or was that just that they all had neckties? They all had collars. Oh yeah, yeah they were all they collars. They didn't want to attach the top to the bottoms. God, they're... neither do I. Uh, did you watch the old He-Man series? Yeah, forever ago, of course. But yeah, <laughs> did you? <laughs> I love all the times they just cut in like 
stock footage of He-Man running because it's always the same run. And it's just like... <laughs> He's doing it, people. Yep, yeah, that's the run. We need to get this on camera for, <laughs> our, for our patrons. I, I really am just going to put... <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to put Nick's head on He-Man's body. It's the exact same thing. It well, is basically the it same It is thing. the same body. Yeah. yeah. Uh, they tried to get me for the original Masters of the Universe movie, but I was already booked, so they settled for Dolph Lundgren. You yep. also two? <laughs> this is mostly for Peter. This is this is mostly me just recording shit to like fuck with him when he produces this. Peter's a great producer. I know some of you are like, why isn't Peter a host? It's because he does more work than us, and uh, he wants credit for that, and we want to give him credit for that. He's the main reason we have this podcast, so thank you, Peter. Stop being nice to me. <laughs> Fuck you, you weren't supposed to hear that now. 